Uh, hi, everybody, and uh, greetings from the Amnesty family to uh, Open Institute and um, all the colleagues uh, that are here, I guess, the digital activists uh, that we are. It's a great pleasure to be um, speaking again at Botswani. Um, this is not my first time, and uh, I'm just thankful to Al, um, to, um, to Jay, to Tom, and um, uh, Ben for keeping this going. It's, it's a wonderful opportunity. We do look forward to also meeting in, in person. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just maybe create a little bit of what's been um, you know kind of our little journey on this topic and uh, you know in 2019 uh, 2018 Amnesty was not working on digital rights in any profound way um, towards the end of uh, 2018 early 2019 we began to notice that there was tremendous um, interest in the state um, in terms of beginning to um, the Kenyan state in terms of beginning to think through um, a series of policies, legal amendments, and um, administrative practices that would really generate a lot of um, private data in the hands of the state. Um, and I just very quickly, there was the uh, amendment to the Registrations of Persons Act that opened up, um, you know, uh, registration to biometrics and to DNA and other, um, uh, you know, personally verifiable uh, data. This passed through Parliament very quickly. Um, a few months later, we discovered that there was a CCTV camera policy that sought to uh, require all public spaces to have CCTV cameras and for them to be networked into a grid um, which would require the owners of these public spaces to make sure that they had compatible equipment uh, to do this. And um, we suddenly began to think something important is happening. But really the big moment, I think, for all Kenyans, and it's a story that's been told many times across the international community, was the Huduma number, the idea of a, a single personal uh, verifiable um, uh, you know, number that could uh, essentially link everybody's data across different government departments, whether it be health insurance issues, whether it be taxation, uh, whether it be um, uh, only a motor vehicle um, or any other interaction with the state. And it was said that this would become the single verifier of truth. This would be your identity as a citizen. And um, we realized that something very big was happening. We then um, uh, watched the national census, of course, like everywhere in the world, it's a 10-year 10, 10 census. And uh, it seemed that all was going well until three days before the census ran. Um, and uh, we saw three additional questions that hadn't been put into the uh, pilot phase of the uh, national census. And those excuse me, those three um, indicators um, or other three questions linked about 60 questions, uh, which at that point were all anonymous um, as per the uh, legal uh, framework, as per the Statistics Act. But it linked them to uh, people's um, uh, personally, personal information. So you had to put in a um, some form of an ID number or a passport. Um, and secondly, which um, was the first time that this had happened, we were now doing the census using tablets and uh, geotagging um, was very, very possible at this point. So they could, the state could have 65 points of data on you, plus know where you live, plus have um, access to your identity uh, number uh, within the state. And we realized that something very big was happening. Um, so we got much more involved in this. And I, 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 I'll leave it there for the moment. But I think what I'm present to over COVID is how much data continues to be mined and collected uh, without the knowledge of Kenya. Um, so three three vignettes, three uh, stories. Patient zero for Kenya was a woman called, is a woman called uh, Brenda. And uh, she was essentially introduced to the nation um, and the very skeptical um, uh, Twitter, Twitterati uh, began to die uh, dissect her. And before we knew it, they had broken down, you know, everything. They'd got into her, uh, Facebook accounts, they got into her uh, Instagram, uh, they were now discussing her sexual life, they were sharing photographs with her um, that she had not consented to, many of them were uh, quite re in, in very revealing um, uh, lingerie, um, they uh, talked about, you know, it was, you know, they basically discussed her whole medical history um, within probably about 48 hours and I, you know, I think for many of us we began to realize that something very dangerous was uh, happening. So. Uh, despite the Hippocratic oath that says all patient data um, is kept um, secret, and that's you know been around even before Jesus Christ, um, we were now able to dissect this woman in front of our eyes on a timeline, right? Um, 
Very soon after that, a member of parliament was um, uh, was revealed to have uh, in a, a very compromising sexual position with um, um, a member of her staff. That went viral again. Um, and then we were into the heat of the COVID period where um, we were suddenly starting to see data being generated about the rate of infections, um, the location of those uh, uh, infections, and this was being done on a daily basis. Um, we still have the same process like many countries in terms of the rate of vaccinations um, and which particular groups um, are being vaccinated um, at what, uh, at, you know, with what kind of trends. Uh, on Sunday, Saturday, I went into the capital of uh, Nairobi and to the central business district and I left my car and I'd forgotten the um, uh, short code that one uses to pay the parking fees. Uh, went into the restaurant to tell somebody that I was coming back and as I was just getting to the restaurant, I got a text um, on my phone saying, uh, you've not paid for parking and this is your number, this is your car license plate and uh, you need to um, uh, pay and this is the short code. Um, I was actually quite grateful that the short code was there because I then could pay for parking. But I was really amazed by the speed at which um, my car had been located. Um, it was clear to uh, the officer that um, I had not paid and that they could reach me. Right. Um, so I think we now live very consciously in an age where medical data, dietary data, physical location, our relationships, um, our consumer choices, uh, the um, uh, our taxes. Um, and the income that we're making uh, either on houses or uh, renting out houses or even in terms of uh, the vehicles that we own. And um, funny enough for Kenya, uh, the, the choices of parties that we want to be members for, this is all being collected without our consent. Um, and uh, it's not just one or two government departments. We have the Kenya Revenue Authority, we have the Office of the Registrar of Political Parties, many of the uh, many of us, including some of us on this call, found that we are members of parties that we had not consented to. But obviously, somebody had taken our um, uh, our ID numbers and just uploaded them into a, a party database in order to get um, a share of the uh, party revenue that is now given to parties of a particular size. But you know, the National Transport um, uh, NTSA, uh, NTSC, um, the Centre, the Ministry of Interior, the Ministry of Health. So I think we need to really. Um, be present to how important this is. But I would also want to make one point, is that there is some data that is just not collected. Um, for example, nobody is very seriously interested in how many adverse affections there are, infect, sorry, um, effects there are of the COVID-19 uh, vaccines that are being used. Nobody is collecting that data. Um, and uh, in that sense, one is curious about not just the misuse of data, but actually the date, the use of data, um, if we are genuinely interested in keeping people safe over this period. So from a Kenyan perspective, I think it's important to recognize Amnesty did a study recently. We um, polled Kenyans on their awareness. And one of the things that was interesting was less than 5%, uh, sorry, less than five out of 10 Kenyans, so about 50% of Kenyans, um, uh, uh, felt that, you know, felt that they understood the right to personal um, uh, data and, and to privacy. Um, four out of ten were familiar with the new uh, Data Protection Act that was passed in 2019 after several of us called for its um, enactment. Um, and uh, very few um, people actually know how to report a data breach. So I'm going to turn to your last question because I think this is, is probably the crux of this um, discussion, which is, you know, what are the things that um, we can do? And I think there is a couple of very broad uh, comments. The first is, Regulation matters, regulation matters, regulation matters. We have to push for um, governments to regulate um, and protect us from the misuse of our own data. We must also push governments to use data that we have consented to, um, to inform public policy. And, then, and this is critical. There's no human rights impact that we will see without a um, data-driven, evidence-based policymaking process. Um, I think the second thing that, um, we uh, need to think about is how do we build rights awareness uh, among the population? Um, you know, Kenya is rife with identity theft, whether it be financial identity, our financial identities, our personal information, our medical information, or um, even the uh, use of um, our data to our identities to commit crimes um, and, and get away with them. So I think this is one area that we need to focus on. And I think it's really important also to see um, that 
you know, to, to link this to the lack of safety for many people on the internet, um, uh, you know, particularly for women, particularly for people um, who are uh, come from sexual minorities. This is the first thing, the first place that, um, you know, these communities um, will have their freedom of expression uh, silenced. It's the first place um, that activists will be targeted and it's the first place that women will be shamed off the internet um, by either using their pri private information or simply making up stuff and dis disinforming everybody. So I think this is um, this is important. I think rather than heavy uh, legislative censorship, what I think we need to see is proactive um, human rights education that actually drowns out the darkness, that drowns out the trolling and uh, the abuse and the intimidation. I think the third thing that I wanted to say is that um, there is still too many of us, middle ground people, who may not be using other people's data. They may not be um, body shaming. They may not be trolling. They may not be using abusive. But they do have this sense um, that actually, what's the problem with our data being available? If you're a person with integrity, if you're not a criminal, if you're not doing anything that is um, that you need to hide, why should you worry? And I think you know the Open Institutes campaign recently was a great campaign and what they said was listen you know you um you know you may not um uh you know be be worried about what you look like without any clothes on but heaven's sake may, very few of us actually walk around without any clothes on um there is something about you know essentially protecting um information um uh, that is personal and private that is so critical at this point and therefore um please don't walk naked uh, on the internet, you wouldn't do it in personal life. Um, and then lastly, I think it's just a very practical thing that has been really interesting in the Kenyan context is, you know, our law, the Data Protection Act, um, provides for a impact assessment um, of any agency or um, I think it's, it's any agency, whether it's corporate, uh, private sector or public, uh, that before they can collect data on you, they have to do an impact assessment to look at what would be the risks. And sadly, you know, the government, um, the executive um, has has seen, um, you know, a, a, a very major defeat in court led by an organization called Katiba Institute, where they failed to do the impact assessment. And for some of us on this call, um, it, it was it was sad that uh, the it had to get to this because um, ten months ago we actually were in a roundtable with um, members of um, uh, the government and the um, public interest litigator. Uh, organization, uh, Katiba Institute, and, and we had reached an agreement that they would rectify um, this part of it and that they would actually do um, the uh, uh, data, uh, you know, the data protection um, impact assessment, and it just wasn't done. Um, so the courts have now struck down uh, the Huduma number process yet again, and the government will appeal. Uh, but unfortunately, um, this is probably the hardest route to take. The easiest route would have been for them to simply comply with the law.